At Chaya in southern Thailand, the Srivijaya Empire once thrived, spanning the seaways between South and East Asia. More than 1,200 years ago, Buddhism began to shape the people, culture, and way of life here. This same Chaya is the birthplace of one of modern Thailand's most creative and influential monks. Buddhadasa Bhikkhu's original name was Ngum Panit. He was born on May the 27th, 1906, in Pumriang, on the coast a few kilometers to the east of Chaya. His father was Siang Panit, a Chinese merchant, and his mother was Kluan, a Thai. Ngum was the oldest child, followed by his brother Yi Goi and their sister Kim Soi. As a child, Ngum learned the natural morality of rural Buddhism. His mother ensured that he respected the lives of other creatures, told the truth, and helped others. At the age of eight, Ngum was sent to live and study at Wat Mai Pumriang, the local temple. When he was 11, Ngum began his formal education at Wat Portaram School, and then continued to the seventh grade at Sarapi Utit School in Chaya. His formal education came to a halt at the age of 16, when his father died. He then took over the management of the family store. As a youth, he read all the latest books and debated about Dharma with local thinkers. When he reached the age of 20, Ngurm followed the Thai tradition of becoming a bhikkhu, or Buddhist monk. Most young men spent only a few months as a bhikkhu, but Tan Buddhadasa felt at home, enjoying the life, its activities, and the study of Dharma. His brother, who now called himself Dhammadasa, decided to leave university in order to help their mother run the family store so that Prangum could follow the homeless, religious life without worries about the family. After Prangum finished his basic Dhamma studies, his uncle Siang, who'd been a monk at an important Bangkok temple, convinced his nephew to go there to advance his scriptural studies. At this time, he made his first attempts at writing, The Benefits of Giving, and Buddhism for Worldlings. By the end of the year, he passed his first Pali exams. But more significantly, his thinking underwent a critical change. New ideas and goals began to take root in his heart as he wrote in a letter to his brother, Bangkok is not the place to find purity. I blundered in hoping to study the scriptures, a goal mixed up with fame and status. The positive results of this is that I've woken up to the fact of my own missteps. In this self-awareness of having taken the wrong step, I have found the clue of how to now take the right step. I've walked in the ways of the world since the minute of my birth until this moment of awakening. Henceforth, I will not follow the world. I will give up the world to search for that which is pure, to follow the noble ones who searched until finding their goal. Once his mind was made up, Buddhadasa Bhikkhu abandoned the path of ranks and titles, returned to Pumriang, and entered the solitary forest life. There began a new era in following the footsteps of the awakened ones. This old abandoned temple, reclaimed by the jungle, became the original site of Suwonmokkapararam. Its name, the grove of the power of liberation makes clear its purpose to the world. The basic principle of life at Suan Mok is 
live plainly, aim high. This means living simply and intimately with nature so that the mind may realize its deepest potential. His foremost work was the practice of Dharma, but soon he found his knowledge insufficient. It was necessary to uncover the guiding themes of practice through a fresh, personal research of the Pali scriptures. The result of this thorough study and practice was an understanding of the Buddhist way, full of joyous energy and ready shaped to be shared with others. A vital force in the work of spreading the Dharma has always been the Dhammadana Foundation, organized by Mr. Dhammadasa among friends and kin. An important aspect of their work has been the Buddha Zazana Quarterly, free of the limitations of Bangkok, it sparked new life within Thai Buddhist thought. The Buddha Sasana quarterly spread quickly through Dharma and intellectual circles, both in Bangkok and the provinces. It was fresh, honest and intelligent. In 1940, the Dharma force from Chaya advanced further when Venerable Buddha Dasa was invited to expound the Dharma at the Buddhist Association, Bangkok's most important venue for Buddhist thought. This and subsequent talks stirred up much interest and even some controversy. The years following, Buddhadasa Bhikkhu went up to lecture regularly in Bangkok and the central and northern provinces. Further, in 1954, he was appointed by the Thai Sangha to represent them at the Buddhist Council in Rangoon, Burma. There he presented the talk certain wonderful characteristics of Theravada Buddhism. Many of his lectures were printed and widely read. Abundant collections of his talks have illuminated essential Dharma truths, seldom discussed publicly. Another aspect of his work has been to bring the Dharma back into the lives and society of ordinary people. He teaches that the world and the Dharma must be one and the same. To survive in the world, we must follow Dharma's direction. He's proposed an education relevant and practical for Buddhist society one that doesn't mimic Western secular materialism. He's proposed a choice for political development called Dhammic Socialism, in which everyone works for the common good, united and guided by Dhamma. Buddhadasa Bhikkhu's contributions have been wide-ranging. For example, he seeks understanding among different religious traditions, Zen Buddhism was unknown in Siam until he translated the Hui Neng Sutra and the Zen teaching of Huang Po into Thai. His profound knowledge of the Bible surprises Christians. In 1967, he was invited to give the annual lectures at the Christian Theological Seminary in Chiang Mai. Many Christians, including nuns and priests, were frequent visitors to Suan Mok, and some have stayed to study. As for Islam, he knows the Quran well and meets regularly with Islamic Dhamma friends. A growing selection of his books has been translated into foreign languages, including Chinese, Indonesian, French, German and English.
His work is read not only by meditators and followers of Buddhism, but also by university students and scholars who seek to understand Buddhism's place in the modern world. A number of doctoral dissertations have studied him. The Dhamma that he has lived and taught attracts visitors of many nationalities and religions. Monks, nuns, priests, and ordinary lay people of all ages and professions visit Suan more, both individually and in groups. In response, Suan Mok moved to its more spacious present location. This is the theater of spiritual entertainments. Inside is an eclectic collection of paintings chosen to convey insights into the human condition and the natural truth of Dharma. Here, Ajahn Buddhadasa and his monks experiment with new ways of teaching the Dharma, even using modern audiovisual equipment. The Buddha's life unfolds around the theater in copies of ancient relief sculptures made from the earliest Buddhist shrines in India. Such art is one more form of working meditation used by the monks at Suan Mo. Another prominent sculpture is this Avalokitesvara Bodhisattva, a Sri Vijaya masterpiece. This is no idol for superstitious worship. Rather, it was made as an object for the wise contemplation of the Bodhisattva's Dharma virtues. Venerable Buddhadasa explains that a properly beautiful Avalokitesvara image must represent purity, wisdom, compassion, and patience. Viewing it, the heart calms. The Nalike Pond is yet another Dharma teaching. It memorializes the subtle wisdom of ancestors who sang about the sublime reality of Nibbana in a children's lullaby. Buildings at Suan Mok arose from the needs of the Dharma work. Two Dharma ships were built by the monks and villagers to store drinking water. Their many other uses justify the effort and expense. So and Mork now offers monthly Dharma trainings to foreign visitors. True Buddhism is a religion which has scientific characteristics. It does not depend on speculations, deductions, and hypotheses the way philosophy does. Instead, it examines, studies, and investigates real things, which in turn brings real results. Buddhism has the characteristics of a science and is in no way a philosophy. Actually, you all ought to know the difference between religion and philosophy. But we can say that for Buddhism, it is a religion that has the form of being a science. This means that it is a system of knowledge based on experience. 
As the number of foreign friends increased, Suan Mork built a center for them in a nearby coconut grove surrounded by hills, caves, marsh, and hot springs. Here too will be meetings for bringing together all religions for the sake of unselfishness and peace. Suan Mork has many shelters for friends who seek Dharma. One area is set aside especially for women. Small huts in the woods allow a quiet, simple life, close to nature. The day at Suan Mok begins at 4 a.m. Monks and laymen come together for chanting the Buddha's words in order to inspire and focus their minds. The monastic life depends on the generosity of the villagers and lay supporters. This unites monks and villagers in the beauty of unselfishness. The monks respond by working to free themselves from the tyranny of me and mine. At eight o'clock, the monks eat together. Lay devotees who have come to offer food chant Dharma rather than chatter about unimportant matters. The residents of Suan Mok serve in many ways. Some help at the workshop creating tools for teaching Dharma to children. Some are mechanics and electricians. A weekly tradition at Suan Mok is for the monks to offer a day of labor to the common good, thus following the motto, wash away selfishness with sweat. Monks who emphasize formal meditation live in solitary huts further back in the forest. This quiet hilltop is the natural shrine at Suan Mok center. On special days, the monks gather here in communion. On holidays, lay people join them. So the simple, peaceful temple of the Buddhist time has a place even today. Tree trunks all around form the temple's doorways and walls. The clouds and ever-changing sky protect it from above. Leaves dancing in sea breezes are living art of profound meaning. Through the 50 years of Suan Mok and the 80 years of Buddha Dasa Bhikkhu's life, time and physical bodies flow in never-ending transformation. In harmony with that flow, the life of service to humanity, the Lord Buddha and the Dharma carries on. This life's work of research, contemplation and teaching is one of freedom and peace. Truly, Buddha Dasa Bhikkhu has lived as a slave of the Buddha should, for the welfare of humanity as well as his own. That our life's work is our Dhamma practice is something Buddha Dasa Bhikkhu never tires of showing and telling.
We hope that everyone will discover that Dharma is duty, that duty itself is Dharma. Whether in the past or today, people never think that duty is Dharma. Instead, we do our duties grudgingly because some need forces us. Because if we don't, we won't eat. This goes against our feelings and we are miserable as we carry out our responsibilities, which is to fall into hell while working. There's nothing funny about this falling into hell as we work. Would everyone who has duties to perform please realize that these duties are Dhamma itself? Dharma is the thing which will save people, and duty will save people because it and Dharma are one. To those who say that God will save us, we must reply that duty alone can save us. If we don't do our duty, a flock of gods won't be able to help us. When duty is done, that duty becomes the god that saves us. The meaning here is exactly the same as Dharma. Whoever has Dharma is saved. Whoever does their duty is saved. Would you please pay attention to the fact that any kind of saving duty should be honored as Dharma. You don't have to add anything special to your everyday duties, but be careful. Whatever you will do, you must see it as Dharma. With your best mindfulness and ready understanding, commit yourself to doing those duties as well and correctly as you can. Then be content with the duties you have. That's how to be happy all the time you are doing those duties. The result is that there is Dharma in all activities. There is joy in all activities because they are Dharma. The nature of all things and all life is to arise, serve a purpose and pass away. Before this body compound dissolves, what kind of life is truly human? How can we make the most of this precious opportunity? Should we live as slaves to desire, materialism and selfishness? Or should we live to serve the truth of nature? Might we dedicate ourselves to creating a life and a world that is filled with Dharma? In A Bequest of Legacies that he leaves for those who would carry on his work, Buddhadasa Bhikkhu shares the hope that, please, may we stick to one special goal, that sooner or later, we will have a world that is complete because of Dharma. Through everyone doing their duty, aware in our hearts, with clarity and wisdom, that this rightful duty is nothing less than the Dharma which will lift us above all our troubles. All this can happen because the world is constantly changing. We ought to work to create those conditions for change which will fulfill this goal for the world. <laughs>